Oh, hello. Well, you're back again. <sighs> I suppose you want another Shadow of the Demon Lord talk video, even though in my last video I said I wasn't going to be making very many more of these because I don't have a Shadow of the Demon Lord campaign going. Well, all right, I'm a softie. What the hell? I uh, actually like doing these videos because it uh, gives me an opportunity to go through all the stuff that uh, is, uh, is in incorporated in this game that I just love to read through and talk about. So that's what I'm going to do. So here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to talk about Kingdom of Skulls, as you can see up on my screen, that was in no way prepared for this video. Um, Kingdom of Skulls. This is a supplement that came out not too long ago. And it is one that I really kind of held off on reading for a while simply because I really didn't know what to make of it. I didn't know what to or how I would incorporate this into uh, my ongoing campaigns or my mega campaign in uh, my own Shadow of the Demon Lord uh, games. So I started reading, reading through it, and I, I, tried, I skimmed through it before, but I sat down earnestly to read through it this time. And I started thinking about what would I do to incorporate this, this, this uh, setting into my campaign if I were going to use it. Now, there's nothing that says I have to use it. This is just one of many uh, regions of the continent of rule that uh, can be used in a campaign, but it doesn't, doesn't mean that you have to. Um, and, um, you know, if, if you totally left this out of your campaign, it, you would be no better or worse off than you are now. But after reading through it, I think there's a place for this setting, uh, especially if you are interested in the uh, the potentially forthcoming uh, campaign that uh, Schwab Entertainment has teased us about several times, and I I personally believe that they're in the process of working on it in some way, shape, or form, uh, probably off and on. But the campaign that I'm alluding to here is the Return of the Witch King. So if you know anything about the lore of Shadow of the Demon Lord and the uh, the world that the, uh, the, the, the game is set in, uh, you'll know that one of the biggest movers and shakers of the uh, known world has been the Witch King known as Ashrakal. Now, Ashrakal, um, he was around... Um, Basically, before the current empire uh, conquered the continent, and he was the guy that essentially defeated the uh, empire that was in place prior to that, which was the uh, the empire that the uh, the people of Adin uh, had established. So, the Witch King is a um, is a really interesting character. And there's actually a supplement, uh, the men of Gog, which I've already gone through that goes really in depth into the history of Ashrakal and, uh, the men of Gog. And I would, um, if you haven't seen that video or if you haven't read that supplement, I'd strongly recommend that you do so because it is a, an excellent supplement. Um, especially if there is going to be a, uh, a, uh, Return of the Witch King or Rise of the Witch King uh, type of campaign, which I, I suspect there will be. So what does that have to do with the King of uh, Kingdom of Skulls? Well, the Kingdom of Skulls, uh, I think, is a great place to set up the Return of the Witch King. It is, um, I, I think it's it's a great place to have it like a, uh, a prequel to that uh, adventure. I, I guess you can't really have a prequel if the adventure hasn't come out yet. Uh, and it may never come out, but um, I believe it will. And even if it doesn't, the Return of the Witch King is something that um, every Shadow of the Demon Lord GM that runs their campaign on this this world, uh, they should at some point have a Return of the Witch King advent uh, either adventure or a campaign. I would suggest a campaign. 
because the the witch king is just too big to be contained in one adventure in my opinion so so the kingdom of skulls how would that be a, a precursor to that well that in, in order to explain that i have to kind of go into the history of the kingdom of skulls so the kingdom of skulls and all this is described in the supplement which i am kind of skimming through here but the kingdom of skulls has its beginnings at the end of the rule of ashrakal so when ashrakal was defeated uh, oh spoilers sorry uh, if you don't know that ashrakal was defeated then sorry you know, um, didn't mean to spoil that for you, but at any rate, at the end of Ashrakal's reign, uh, his subjects were disbanded. Um, they pretty much just fled to every corner of rural, with probably most of them heading back to the desolation where they came from. Um, many went to other parts of the continent. Um, several went underground. And those became the troglodytes. And, but um, there are some that escaped through other means. And one group in particular was a group that followed uh, one of Ashrakal's um, closest uh, allies. And she doesn't, she's not named, she doesn't have a name, but they refer to her as the Dark Lady. Now, the Dark Lady. Um, she was somebody that caught Ashrakal's eye when Ashrakal was looking for ways to um, really come back from a, a bitter defeat um, when he tried to take over the, uh, the land of um, uh, Balgrandia, uh, which I have another video of um, a few back. So you might want to check that out as well. But at one point, um, the Witch King tried to uh, go in there and um, take over Bal Bal <clears throat> Balgrendia, uh, but he failed miserably. And in his defeat, he was looking uh, through his empire for anybody that had resources that could help him um, basically come back from this defeat uh, stronger with a weapon that would uh, help him to avoid the same um, defeat that he had in Balgrendia. And so he decided to pull together uh, uh, basically a team of um, wizards, warlocks, uh, anybody who had uh, arcane knowledge to build what is, uh, what is mentioned in the supplement as the Oblivion Engine. Now, it doesn't really say what the Oblivion Engine was uh, or what it was supposed to do. Uh, I imagine that will be something that will probably be mentioned again in a supplement um, or a an adventure or a campaign uh, that uh, Schwab Entertainment puts together. But, uh, you know, just the name Oblivion Engine just kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, is very evocative. So um, he he's calling all these people uh, from his empire to help out. And one of the people that... Uh, responds is the Dark Lady. Now, the Dark Lady makes her presence um, known by basically um, creating a portal and stepping directly into Ashrakal's uh, throne room, which Ashrakal had warded against such intrusion. And so by her showing him her level of mastery in uh, her magics, uh, she greatly impressed him, and she did so at the um, risk of her own life because she could have very well had posed herself as a threat to him by being able to overcome his magic. Uh, but uh, he didn't see it that way. He saw her as somebody that he could um, he could utilize uh, in this task. So here's where it mentions the Oblivion Engine. Right there. So... At any rate, uh, the Dark Lady comes in, and so they start working together, and uh, Ashrakal falls for her because she's hot, and, you know, she's she got the magic, and so he's, like, uh, fawning all over her, but she plays it cool 
and, you know, pretty much keeps him at uh, arm's length. Uh, despite his uh, numerous attempts to get him, get her to marry him. Now, you know, Asher Call already had like, you know, 875 wives or something like that. It's not that many. It's, it actually says how many wives he has in here somewhere, but I forget the exact number. At any rate, uh, uh, well, actually it says it's right here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, no, it doesn't. So anyway, um, Asher Call you know, already has a bunch of wives and he has a bunch of uh, kids from these wives. And, um, you know, he doesn't need another wife, clearly, but he is very smitten by the dark lady. So uh, them working together very closely, he tries to get her to marry him. She uh, puts him off over and over again and basically plays hard to get. And, you know, it, he falls for it hook, line and sinker. So, um, these two become really close and they eventually have, um, twin sons born from their partnership. Now the twin sons, um, uh, play a part later on in the story of the, uh, the dark lady and her rise. But for now they're just, you know, they're born. And so they become, uh, the heirs of, um, Asher calls kingdom. And that pisses off all of the other heirs um, because, uh, you know, like I said, he had bunches of wives and hundreds of kids. And so they all wanted a piece of the action, uh, but he didn't give a crap about any of those. So he basically gave them the finger and, oh, you didn't see that, the finger and uh, says, no, nope, none of you matter. These two kids, these twins, they're my real kids and all of you can suck it. So he says that, not in those words, my words, um, and that pisses them all off. And so they all start trying to, to go after him and the dark lady and the two kids and, and lots of assassination attempts are made. Um, and this results in what's referred to as the great calling. The great calling is where the witch king says, uh, -huh, uh, no, you didn't. And he goes out and pretty much kills all of his kids and uh, his, you know, turns his, his wives into Gorgons uh, and just sends them off into dungeons all over the, uh, the continent uh, to get rid of them. And so uh, he raises all of his uh, dead kids that he murdered uh, into undead thralls so they could serve him um, you know, the right way. Uh, all right, so that happened. And so that caused, you know, kind of a, um, a rift in the empire. Things were not going well. He already had a defeat with Balgrindia. So this was not a great time in the uh, time of Asher Call. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit here now. Uh, and at this point, the um, Calasians came from wherever they originated from, which uh, could be somewhere else in the world, or it could be uh, some other world altogether. But at any rate, they came and they came to conquer. And so when they made it to the continent of rule, they just spread out and started knocking out um, strong, you know, the, uh, the, the witch king strongholds left and right. Eventually, the witch king was uh, confronted in Cacris by the, uh, the general of the um, Calasians. And um, the witch king is killed. So once that happens, then his empire pretty much just falls apart. And like I mentioned earlier, they scatter to the winds. Now, one of the groups, the group that was uh, led by the dark lady and w was comprised of basically her followers and her sons, they decide to hit the road um, in a different way. They were afraid, the dark lady was afraid that her um, being so close to the, uh, to the emperor put her in a particularly vulnerable position. So rather than trying to escape over land or underground or, um, you know, through some other means like that, she decided to take her and her followers through a very dangerous root. And so she um, decided to go through hell, literally. There is a portal to hell in the city of Cacris, and the witch king had made a deal with the devil 
that if he or any of his servants ever needed safe passage uh, through hell, then, you know, the devil would grant that. And so the, uh, the, the dark lady took, took up that offer uh, or cashed in that, uh, that offer and was allowed to enter hell through the portal that is in Cacris. Now, the problem is that the deal that the witch king made only, only um, allowed safe passage through hell, but it did not guarantee an exit from hell. Um, that was for the witch king her, or the, uh, the dark lady to, you know, find on her own. So there was not going to be any help from Diabolus or any of the devils uh, in hell that would get her through and out the other side. So she found herself and all of her uh, followers trapped uh, essentially in hell. And they spent months just wandering hell, dealing with all of the horrors uh, of hell. And so at one point she found a demon or a devil, I should say, that um, had uh, promised her or had um, uh, had made her believe that, that uh, he could give her a way out. Uh, but that turned out to be a double cross. And so she um, learned from that mistake and then was a little bit more careful when she struck a deal with another devil. Uh, this devil was known as the Fly Father, and this devil decided that uh, he was going to show her the way out. But he extracted from her a bargain before showing her the way out. And the bargain was, you know, she, she thought that uh, she could just give him, you know, some jewels and, you know, magic items or whatever. But uh, he was like, nah, nah, that crap didn't interest me. Uh, so she's like, well, what does interest you? And he's like, I would be pretty happy with your promise of peace. And so she had to promise him that uh, she would um, basically be at a life of peace um, and be content to be so. And it kind of goes through that here. It doesn't really give the details of what that exactly means. Um, but she said, right, that's easy. We can do that. So he shows her the way out. However, this was also a bit of a double cross because the way out ended up being uh, to a land that is uh, pretty crappy. So at this point, let me go ahead and show you a map of, not that, a map of, no, not that either, a map of the continent of Rural. All right, this is from my campaign, so ignore all the scratches up here. Um, all right, so the K Chris is over here in the center of the empire, and she made her way through hell and out again and ended up in this part of the world. Now, this part of the world down here is a is described as being extremely desolate and um, very barren, um, bereft of uh, a lot of life, not much there that you can survive on, um, no indigenous peoples because there's nobody really that could, uh, you know, safely live there. Um, but this is where she and her followers find themselves. And this is what she... Um, basically decides to call home. Now, this place is, uh, is very inhospitable and she spends many years just trying to eke out a, uh, a way for her people to survive um, with the meager um, resources that are available here. And not only that, but uh, as you can see, it borders um, the Shield Mountains and there is a into the endless step. But when she tries to exploit that, she finds that the endless step is um, 
it's populated by an, an endless number of centaur. Uh, the, the endless step is the land of the centaur. And so the centaur uh, don't take kindly to their new neighbors. And so they, uh, they push back hard. And so that starts essentially a rivalry or a war between the kingdom of skulls uh, and the centaurs, uh, which lasts up really to this very day. So the, uh, the dark lady manages to, you know, get her people settled and they find ways to survive, not great ways, but ways to survive. And so they manage to establish this kingdom. Um, the kingdom, however, is, you know, largely bereft of life. So she has to call upon a lot of dark powers in order to, um, not only secure her borders and secure her kingdom, but also to protect her people. So she really embraces, uh, necromancy and starts, you know, essentially just calling up, uh, undead left and right. Uh, and also this land was, uh, evidently the, the the site of a battle that had occurred at some time in the past because there were uh, lots of battlefields and lots of um, ancient remains scattered about. And so she took advantage of that and used her, um, her dark magic to uh, essentially raise an army of the dead. But what the Dark Lady was not interested in doing, probably because of her uh, bargain with the devil, was to uh, use this to expand into other territories. Really, the only place she was interested in expanding into was the Endless Steppe, simply because there were resources there that she could use to feed her people. Um, so that was really the only thing that she maintained any type of effort to try to... Um, you know, to try to get into. But as far as moving elsewhere, there really wasn't any place else that she could easily reach. Uh, her other neighbors are the Patchwork Lands, which were almost as inhosp inhospitable as um, the area that her kingdom was in. And then further to the south, it just gets worse. You know, the Blasted Lands and then the Blotland. Uh, and she didn't want, really want to piss off the, uh, the Jotun. Um, so she pretty much decided she's sticking with the Kingdom of Skulls uh, and the borders that she had established. And so that, that is where, uh, she makes her happy home. And you can see it's pretty far south. So the further south you go on this map, since it's in the southern, uh, southern hemisphere of the planet, um, the colder it gets. So it's cold, um, and just a nasty, nasty place. Uh, to be. And that reflects in how her people adapt to the land. They all adapt to living in this harsh uh, realm. And so they, they become very thin, uh, very pale. Uh, they subsist on food that would probably make people elsewhere um, just, you know, projectile vomit. And, um, you know, that, that is, that, that's just the, the way that they have to survive. Uh, so, you know, that, that is the kingdom of skulls, hard people, uh, with a hard ruler. Now the ruler herself, given her power and given, given her, her, um, her legacy, uh, the people eventually come to see her not only as their, uh, their queen or their empress, uh, it's a kingdom. So, um, it actually should be a queendom. But at any rate, um, as her queen, as their queen, but they also eventually view her as their goddess. And so they start worshiping her as their goddess and they start to, um, you know, form a cult around uh, the worship of her. And this results in a further dep uh, deprivation of the society, uh, resulting in lots of... Um, uh, lots of uh, practices that result in, you know, the, the legal murdering of people if they, you know, if they uh, cross uh, the cult and um, that sort of thing. Also, due to the shortage of food, there is a necessity at times for people to eat their dead, which in this in this world results in the uh, the people being the, the eaters uh, of the dead. 
uh, being transformed into ghouls. So you got a pretty substantial ghoul population uh, within the Kingdom of Skulls as well. Um, all right, so let me get back to the, uh, yeah, this thing. And let me shrink it a little bit so I can see what uh, what's going on here. Um, all right, so the Dark Lady gets her, uh, her, her kingdom set up. And so it takes her a while to do so. There are some pictures of her. I'm not really digging it, but uh, you kind of get the, the drift. And um, basically, the, um, the kingdom is pretty much left by itself, you know, left alone. Other, you know, other, uh, other uh, countries really don't want to have anything to do with her. She does some dealings with some of the, the, uh, the barons that have set themselves up in the patchwork lands. But for the most part, uh, she's kind of isolated. Um, so you've got, uh, she's got this kingdom and, um, this goes through some of the, um, interesting places in the kingdom. Um, but, uh, before I get to that, let me just kind of wrap up the story and bring it up to the current time. So, um, given that, um, she is, she was one of the, um, you know, closest companions to the witch king. She was always on the lookout for any signs that the uh, witch king would return uh, because his his death was very mysterious in that he was beheaded but once he was beheaded uh, his body basically just fell into a swarm of snakes that slithered off uh, into all you know all kinds of directions and disappeared uh, so there was always a belief that the witch king would return uh, simply because his death was, you know, extremely uh, mysterious and and uh, very occultish. Uh, so people took that, you know, the slithering off of the snakes as a sign that um, he'll be back someday. So since the Dark Lady was on the lookout for any signs, she found herself uh, a seer uh, that had true uh, power to see into the future. And so she were, she called this person the Oracle and brought her into her tower uh, to keep, um, you know, essentially keep tabs on, um, you know, any signs that, that the Witch King might be coming and also just kind of uh, keep her up to date on things that are going on in her kingdom and, so, and stuff like that. So the Oracle at some point uh, started giving her prophecies that the Witch King was getting ready to uh, return to the world. So she has started to bolster her armies. She has started to try to wrap up the war with the centaurs so that she can um, devote her full uh, power and um, and uh, resources to assisting the Witch King, uh, when he comes back. Uh, part of this is a, um, her, somehow she has managed to um, cause towers to appear throughout um, the, the continent of, of uh, rule. And so I believe one appeared in the city of Nessus, which is in the... Um, uh, which <clears throat> it's in the Confederacy of nine cities. So Nessus would be over here. Uh, there is a tower. And if you look at the Nessus uh, supplement, the tower is actually um, mentioned. It's not really detailed, uh, but it is mentioned. And one of the Dark Lady's servants rules that tower. Uh, there is an another tower that appeared in Cacris. And it mentions that uh, towers also appear throughout the patchwork lands. Um, and I think it's uh, the uh, Northern Reach as well. Uh, but at any rate, she's causing these towers to appear throughout the continent for a reason. Now, it doesn't really give the reason in the supplement. But uh, again, I think that's one of the reveals that we'll see when the official Witch King Returns um, uh, campaign comes out. So that is pretty much brings us up to modern times. The, the Dark Lady still, still lives, sustained by her dark magic. Uh, she's worshipped as a god, and she's got an army of the dead ready to march out into the, uh, out into the world. Um, so 
that's part of the supplement. The, the, a lot of the rest of the supplement talks about uh, details. Uh, I'm not going to go through a whole lot of the details. Um, you know, you can read those for yourself, but I'll touch on the things that I like. Um, some of the places of interest include the bone fields, which is those areas where there were, there were ancient battles that she was able to uh, call upon to, um, you know, raise dead and um, summon dark energies. <clears throat> and uh, that is where she wrote, she raised her Tower of Blue Flame, uh, which is uh, where she actually resides. And uh, I guess you could consider that to be the uh, capital of her kingdom. So the Tower of Blue, Fl Blue Flame is where she and all of her servants uh, that serve her directly um, reside, including the Oracle. Um, and it kind of talks about the, um, uh, tower briefly here. Again, it doesn't go into details. There's no map of the tower, uh, but it does, uh, it, it does kind of, uh, uh, allude to the fact that the, it, that it is, uh, has many, many levels and, uh, anybody who enters the tower without the, um, the dark ladies leave, uh, is essentially trapped there because the tower's levels are essentially a maze. And uh, unless you are granted a uh, leave by the uh, Dark Lady, you're essentially doomed to uh, wander the tower uh, forever. Um, also, the, guard, the tower is guarded uh, at all times by a bunch of Chainbound um, who attack anybody that uh, was not invited by the Dark Lady. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, all right. Bone Hollow is basically the biggest town in, um, or the biggest settlement in the, uh, in the kingdom. And so it talks a little bit about that. Uh, it's not really a happy place. Uh, you know, most of the people live in, uh, filth and squalor. Um, but, uh, it is the land's major settlement settlement. So if people do come here for official reasons, uh, they typically go through Bone Hollow, uh, before uh, seeking an audience with the Dark Lady. Uh, one of the uh, interesting things in uh, the kingdom is the Circus of Screams. And this is a circus uh, that uh, comes and goes. It um, is kind of um, not really detailed, but it gives an overview of the types of um, uh, people that are in the circus. It's run by a dude named the Harlequin. Uh, and they got a picture of him right here. He looks a little bit creepy. And um, basically it talks about the circus coming and doing all kinds of, uh, you know, crazy and disgusting and horrific um, shows, ending with one that um, involves uh, children and lots of uh, torture and um, um, dismemberment and... And yeah, that, that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's not a happy circus. It's definitely not Barnum and Bailey. Um, but, uh, that would be an, that would be an interesting thing to include in an adventure, um, uh, having to go through the, um, or having to sit through a circus of screams, um, which I'll get to more in a little bit. So the, uh, death's gate, um, is another place <clears throat> that is the boundary essentially between the kingdom of skulls and the uh, endless step. And this place is uh, guarded by something called, um, uh, where was it here? It was guarded by, uh, da, 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 da. nope, I have lost it. So until it comes back to me, I will have to, um, Hold off on that. So at any rate, um, Hazadel is mentioned here. Hazadel One Eye is the commander of the Centaur forces, um, and so he's he's the only Centaur that's really mentioned uh, in all of this. But he's the one essentially that is uh, holding off. He, him, and his uh, Centaur army is is what's what has been holding the uh, Dark Lady at bay. Um, all right. So let's see what else here. Blister Hills, um, uh, Agri Stotdidditen. I don't know how to pronounce that, but at any rate, it's an old dwarven, uh, stronghold that, um, uh, that is still standing. That might be an interesting place. Um, 
see ice giants <clears throat> which are some islands um there let's see uh, there they're saying a few islands that would scarcely warrant mentioning if not for the 13 life-size statues of giants standing on them each has been carved from a solid block of ice stand up to 30 feet tall so you know that's pretty interesting not exactly really sure what the purpose is i'm sure that has a purpose it's not mentioned here what it is um, it suggests that the ice giants uh, move based on the claims of some fishermen. Mm, you know, it's pretty much left up to you to do what you want with um, 13 life-size statues of giants. So that's that. Uh, the Darkening Fen is uh, another area that you could uh, place an adventure in that would be um, kind of a, a creepy, creepy place, a hopeless port. Um, again, these are just areas that uh, you can visit um, and set adventures in as you need to. There's not really a whole lot of uh, adventure hooks uh, associated with each of these. You might uh, get a nugget or two out, uh, but uh, I'm going to actually talk about some adventure hooks er, uh, here in a little bit. <clears throat> but I wanted to get through the supplement first before I start talking about that. Um, it talks about Meriwether's band here. That is a uh, band of mercenaries that uh, had actually made it into um, the dark, uh, across the Dark Lady's borders with the intent of killing her. But uh, the leader of this um, mercenary band actually was intending to sacrifice his mercenaries to the Dark Lady. And one of them, this uh, person named Lissa Meriwether, discovered this and killed him before that could happen. So, uh, before he died, he put a curse on her, which trapped her in the borders of the uh, the Dark Lady's uh, kingdom. So she's stuck there and is um, the leader now of this man of, uh, band of mercenaries. So, and probably something uh, that would be interesting for adventurers to to um, to run across and perhaps make a uh, a deal with um, to uh, fight the the Dark Lady if that is. <clears throat> Uh, what the can what uh, your adventure would be about or your campaign uh, the suicide force is pretty interesting place it um, it's since the um, kingdom of skulls is so bereft of uh, vegetation there are forests but the forests are so sickly and the wood is so uh, so um, so bad that um, th those resources really couldn't be used by the people because the wood couldn't be used uh, to make buildings because it, it basically is just too soft and, and not um, not useful in as building material. So what um, the Dark Lady tried to do is to uh, capture some druids. And so she sent some agents out into the, um, the low country and uh, captured a bunch of druids and kidnapped them, brought them back to the kingdom and decided to have them raise a forest because that's what druids do, right? Um, well, they refused. So, and they were being difficult. And so the dark lady had them murdered and brought back to life or unlife as uh, grave thralls. And so the grave thrall druids uh, raised the forests uh, that uh, the dark lady wanted, but th being uh, corrupted by necromantic manage, magic, necromantic magic, uh, easy for you to say, uh, the force that they raised was also warped by this magic and twisted into a dark, uh, cursed, ugly um, place, uh, which was, again, useless uh, for, um, for building because once a tree was cut down, uh, it, uh, it essentially rotted. So um, that was a waste of time. And so they just kind of left the, 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 uh, the suicide. The, they called it the suicide forest and um, they just kind of left it alone. The reason they call it the suicide forest is because it, uh, the, the necromantic energies that had um, re, you know, helped it um, come, into, come into being uh, also has a tendency of making people want to kill themselves when they're in the proximity or within the forest itself. So uh, that's not totally stolen from uh, the suicide forest in Japan at all. Uh, this is totally, totally in its uh, its own thing. So uh, suicide forest, um, cool place. Uh, all right. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh, um, a lot of the witch king or the uh, lot, yeah, a lot of the witch, witch king's followers 
uh, went with the Dark Lady and her, uh, her people uh, and settled in the Kingdom of Skulls as well. And so you're going to find a lot of uh, Kingdom or Children of Gog uh, also within, the, um, within this uh, Kingdom. Um, so not only the Dark Lady's people uh, that she brought, but also uh, Children of Gog that came uh, with the um, that came from the desolation uh, and just decided to escape with her. So um, let's see what else here. I already talked about the uh, the ghouls. There's one right there. Um, the other people that populate the, the kingdom or that come to the kingdom are really just outcasts and people that have no other, literally no other place to go. Um, because you would literally have to have no other place to go in order to go to the uh, kingdom of skulls. And so, you know, some, some of the population are murderers or are people that are wanted for horrendous crimes uh, that uh, sought refuge and were granted refuge in, within the kingdom. Um, all right. I already talked about the Dark Lady as a goddess. Um, and what else? Um, okay, the heirs of Gog. So there, there are, I already mentioned the Dark Lady's sons. Now, the Dark Lady's uh, twin sons um, came with her, and they were instrumental in helping her establish her territory. But a tragedy fell on both of them. Uh, one of them, Amra, the Prince of War, he was murdered by uh, Centaur. And so he, um, you know, helped. Uh, well, he was one of the leaders of the Dark Lady's armies. And he was the strong one. He was the, um, you know, he was the warrior. And uh, as the general of her army, she, you know, relied on him greatly. And so she raised him from the dead to continue serving her as um, her Prince of War. Now, um, it, it goes into detail here. He's pretty cool on um, the way he is um, statted out here. And you can see one of the things that's uh, super cool about him is that he has, uh, his weapon is uh, the Soul Stealer, which is a, um, well, let me see if it's, if it's described here. <clears throat> I think it was, but I'm not seeing it right offhand. So anyway, the um, soul sealer is his uh, primary weapon, and it does, you know, basically what it says, is steal souls. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's Stormbringer there, right? So um, he's an undead that uh, steals souls with his sword. Pretty freaking awesome, and he's got all kinds of other powers, powers as well, um, as, uh, including the Word of Death. Uh, and you can see he has uh, an epic recovery here. So this guy is a badass. Uh, difficulty is 750. There aren't too many of those. So, yeah. Uh, so the other prince that um, was her other twin son uh, was um, Anri. And he's known as the Prince of Plagues. The reason why is because he was actually uh, murdered by a demon that he had summoned to try to help kill uh, Centaur. But the demon um, rebelled and killed um, Anri. Um, and, um, you know, once again, the, uh, the Dark Lady uh, needed him because he was her uh, you know, he was her, uh, her, her, her war mage. And so she raised him from the dead and um, he continues to serve her as a prince of plagues. Now, the demon that killed him was a plague demon. And so when he was raised, he continued to, to, to be uh, uh, inflicted with this, uh, with, with, you know, diseases uh, that he could not get rid of and so he became the prince of plague and the the creatures that follow him and that he raises um are likewise um uh plague plague uh, undead plague bearers is what they're referred to as um all right here's soul stealer it goes into detail there and then um Henry's, uh weapon is a staff which he created himself known as a staff of dooms and it is um it's discussed here. Both of those uh, items are relics, incidentally. <clears throat> so before you throw those two guys into your game and um, have your um, your master tier 
uh, players um, have their way with them, uh, just be aware that you're potentially going to um, give your players a couple of pretty powerful relics. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. Um, it talks about some of her other servants, this dude named uh, the Unborn, which is the chief of her warlocks. Uh, he calls himself the Unborn uh, because he's he, like one of his, like one of the uh, servants of the Witch King. The Witch King had uh, his, um, I forget what uh, the, what it was called, what they were called in the um, in the in the Children of Gog, but uh, basically they were his uh, ring wraiths. Um, these were his servants that were very powerful, and they served him uh, as um, you know, they're uh, as very powerful. Uh, oh, I can't talk today. Okay, so they're powerful servants, and they were his ring wraiths, and to protect them from people that would use their true names against them because true name magic is a thing in this world. Um, they, they didn't go by their true names. They went by um, a different moniker. And this guy called himself the unborn because he was actually not born. He was, um, uh, it was just described as he was removed from his uh, mother's belly um, and not actually truly born. And so um, it doesn't say why or how, but um, you know, I don't think we really need to know that. But at any rate, he is one of the, um, uh, he's the warlock lord. He's the, he's the, uh, he's the chief uh, magician um, that uh, serves her, you know, besides her dead magician son. Um, okay, so that is the unborn. And then it talks about the Black Rose. The Black Rose is a... Um, uh, she is a key figure, as it states right there, responsible for estab establishing the formal cult of the Dark Lady. So in order to uh, keep this lady uh, close and uh, devoted to her, um, the Black Rose was um, given the gift of unlife as a vampire. And so she serves the uh, Dark Queen um, and pretty much leads the, uh, the, the cult of the Dark Lady. Um, then there is Zox. Zox is a big ass ogre. Um, and he is just a, another tool that is used by the Dark Lady as a um, bodyguard or servant. Um, uh, also, likewise, he is um, you know, modified somewhat to, um, uh, to serve her properly. Um, let me see what else here. Uh, Gorgol, the spy master. He is a professional spy, uh, that placed himself into her service and he has, uh, spies out in the real world, um, out there, uh, spying on things and feeding information to him. Uh, this guy's pretty cool because, um, what the dark lady did in order to ensure the secrecy of, his spying network was to drive a nail into his skull and to the skull of each one of his spies. And so in order for that spy to communicate with Gorgol, um, they have to light a candle, I think, uh, or something uh, up to the nail and heat the nail up. And that allows Gorgol to communicate with his spy. Uh, so Gorgol has like 50 some odd spies. He's meaning she's got 50 some odd nails in his skull. Um, which is pretty, uh, pretty damn, uh, you know, wild. And, um, again, it kind of evocative. I'm thinking, you know, you know this guy looks a little bit like Pinhead from, um, uh, you know, the uh, Clyde Barker movies, but at any rate, uh, another cool guy. He's, she's got the Chronicler, which is a, a dude that's undead that is essentially writing the story of her life. Um, he's in the tower with her and then the Oracle is, uh, documented here. Um, that's another picture of the dark lady, a little bit better. Um, all right. So then we've got the, um, <clears throat> uh, all right. Then we've got, um, uh, some creatures that are unique to, or not necessarily unique to this area, but are described here, uh, that are not in other, uh, supplements. Um, so you got the bite, um, 
this uh, the Bone Knight is actually kind of cool because it's actually the uh, uh, an undead centaur. And so, you know, since they've been at war with centaurs and since she raises dead, cre you know, dead creatures, there would be lots of uh, centaur for her to utilize against the centaur, which would be kind of horrid. So uh, those are known as Bone Knights. Pretty cool. And <clears throat> I would think that they would be more than difficulty five, but maybe they're just... Uh, fodder, uh, you know, shock troops, that sort of thing. Uh, at any rate, then we have the Harbinger. Uh, the Harbinger is basically the, um, again, another kind of um, uh, evokes imagery of the Ringwraiths. They, they are flyers. They kind of lead her armies uh, from the air, um, but they don't ride anything. They, they fly themselves, but they are essentially black shadows that, uh, that fly through the air uh, and hurl black fire down upon the, their enemies. <clears throat> All right. So um, what else we got here? Oh, it talks about grave thralls as being a big uh, chunk of her servants. Um, <laughs> um, oh, uh, actually, a it uh, gives you the stats of a grave thrall uh, if you want to create one as a character. Uh, so if you want to actually be a grave thrall, here you go. You got the stats. You got the expert um uh, and you got the you got novice paths, and you also have got um, expert paths available uh, to you here for that purpose. Um, but that kind of depends on what type of campaign you're going, you're planning on running. Um, so I'm not going to detail those things. All right, so let's back up a little bit. So I've already I've gone through this just to kind of give you an idea of what's in the supplement. Now, the whole purpose of this video is for me to talk to you about how you would use this in an actual campaign and or how I would use this in a campaign. I don't know how you would use it, but if I were to use this, it would be it would be kind of difficult to use this setting uh, as a starting point for a campaign. So in order to do that, um, well, let's just talk about the the uh, the the adventure ideas that they they give here. Um, so under the walking in the shadow of death, it gives you some ideas. So um, one, two, three, four bullet points. Yeah. All right. So the first one is a patron sends the players characters into the kingdom of skulls to gather intelligence about the dark lady and her designs. Characters find a few willing people, a few people willing to help and, and excuse me. And they run afoul of the dark lady's cultus uh, soon after they arrive. Now I got the hiccups. Uh, with the mission in tatters, a group has to find some way to escape. Okay, so that, that would be one campaign that would be presumably good characters or, you know, good-ish characters coming in to try to spy on the Dark Lady, getting found out, and then having to try to escape. Yeah, that, that wouldn't be a bad campaign. Uh, a powerful seer discovers the Dark Lady, gains much of her knowledge from the Oracle, uh, or discovers that the Dark Lady gains much of her, her knowledge from the Oracle, uh, to blend the Dark Lady, they send characters uh, to murder her, uh, the, or the Oracle. So this would be not necessarily a good campaign. I would see this being more as, you know, one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, guilds out there um, that uh, see the Dark Lady as an imminent threat. And um, they either send people to kill the Oracle or they're hired to send um, people to, um, you know, assassins to murder the Oracle. Uh, so, you know, assassinations isn't screaming out, uh, you know, noble cause. So that would be a, uh, probably a, an evil ish campaign. Um, the dark lady's armies finally triumph over the centaurs being marching in, in the step to grow the kingdom's territory and gain access to arable lands. Player characters are sent with a small force to close the pass that crosses the shield mountains. But when they arrive, they find it held by another, even more terrible enemies. So, eh, I don't dig that one too much. Uh, the group, having signed on to fight for a minor baron in the patchwork land, suffers a tremendous defeat and must flee west to escape uh, the enemy forces. However, to the west lies this kingdom of skulls. Once the characters cross into that haunted land, they have to survive in that hostile landscape long enough for the pursuers to give up. So this would be another... Um, you know, you got no place else to go. The only place that's available to you is the Kingdom of Skulls. Once you're in there, you're kind of stuck. Um, I don't dig that one either. Uh, that that's kind of railroading your uh, players to to um, uh, to to be trapped, and it really doesn't does, it doesn't scream out to me as a fun 
um, way to start a, a campaign. Doable. I mean, it's you know, if your if your uh, players would be into that, then great. But I don't think my players would be. All right. So, how would I use this campaign? I, of all of these, I like the um, the first one best. Um, a patron sends the characters in there to spy on the dark lady. Um, and what I would do with that, I think I would use that and I think I would expand upon that. I might even incorporate the second bullet point into, uh, that campaign by having somebody in the, in the group, uh, actually be hired to murder the Oracle as one of the reasons why they're going into the kingdom of skulls. Um, so those are two, two pretty good, um, two pretty good uh, hooks to get, uh, an adventure going. But as far as a campaign goes, um, what I would do is I would have the patron who is suspecting, uh, that's the dark lady's up to something. Um, you know, be somebody that is noticing the, uh, these towers coming up all over, all over uh, the continent and realizing that they are originating from, <clears throat> uh, from the uh, kingdom of skulls. And so this would be a way I, I would use this as a precursor into the campaign that, uh, brings about the return of the witch King. And so I almost kind of view this as a, um, a, a, almost a suicide mission because your characters are probably not going to escape the kingdom of skulls uh, with their lives. If they do, um, and it's possible that they could, I mean, you know, master tier characters are pretty powerful, but I would almost arrange it so that they, they can't, or if they did, they would be severely damaged. Because what I what I would want, what I would look, what I would look for is this to set up the return of the Witch King by enabling the Dark Lady to have a massive army ready at the doorstep of the Empire to march uh, once the Witch once the uh, Witch King comes back, and so you can't really have a campaign that. Uh, goes in and kills the Dark Lady and you know wipes out her her undead army because that would you know, that would kill th that being a precursor to the return of the witch King. Um, so instead I would have, you know, basically characters that are coming in here, either trying to remain secret or trying to gather intelligence, um, getting, you know, uh, gathering some, um, good information, but at some key point they are discovered and then they have to get the fuck out of Dodge and, you know, they're being, uh, you know, basically ch uh, chased after by uh, the Dark Lady, her two sons, and just some super powerful undead. And the make it known that the um, player's goal isn't to fight them, because fighting them would be suicide. Um, make it so that if these, um, if if her sons die within the borders of uh, the kingdom. So you could do this. You could have it so that they, when they die, but if they're within the, uh, the kingdom of skulls, they reform. And, um, you know, in other words that you can't kill them, you cannot permanently kill her sons. And the dark lady is also, uh, basically immortal here. So I would make that very clear and make sure that your characters know that there's no way that they can, kill these people. They could fight them, but their fighting would be so that uh, they could find a way to escape. So that would be my, um, that would be the way that I would uh, set up the whole thing from the get go. Um, make it so, however, make it so that the, the information that they are getting is um, crucial to the rest of the uh, rest of the nations, rest of the, the world, uh, known world, uh, have, uh, something that they can use against the witch King when he returns. So they actually walk out of there, you know, maybe the last surviving member of the, uh, of the party, uh, gets right across the borders before he's struck down. And he has something that gives hope 
to the rest of the um, the, the rest of the, the continent and the rest of the uh, the, the nations uh, of some way that they could potentially defeat the Witch King. But since this guy is struck down, um, this thing is lost and won't be recovered until uh, some point in the campaign, uh, which is um, you know, the following campaign, which would be the Rise of the Witch King. <clears throat> and that would be a quest for one of the adventurers from that campaign to seek, you know, the, um, the secret that was um, taken out of the Kingdom of Skulls. I don't know, maybe it's, uh, maybe the secret is the, uh, the Witch King's heart, you know, that the, uh, the Dark Lady managed to uh, secret away from Kacris, uh, or, you know, his brain or something, I don't know. Um, at any rate, that's what I would, um, that's how I would do a campaign if I were going to do something like that in um, the uh, Kingdom of Skulls. Um, another way that you can kind of look at the Kingdom of Skulls is this is basically Mordor without um, orcs, uh, you know, replacing orcs with undead uh, and men of Gog. So the, um, the, the Mordor of this, this, this campaign world uh, is the Kingdom of Skulls. Uh, you know, you don't have a uh, Mount Doom, obviously, but, you know, the, the, late, the Dark Lady's uh, Tower of Blue Flame uh, can serve as Mount Doom. Um, but, uh, you know, you can kind of think of it as, you know, everybody is fearful of the Kingdom of Skulls. And um, they're afraid of what the Dark Lady could do to bring about the uh, return of the Witch King. So that's how you would set up. Uh, these campaigns to uh, go from one right into the Rise of the Witch King. <clears throat> okay, um, how long is this video already? So this video is pretty damn long. So let me go ahead and wrap it up there. I think I've touched on pretty much everything I wanted to from this uh, supplement. It's an excellent supplement. It's a great supplement, just not something that you go into uh, lightheartedly. Um, th there's a lot of dark stuff here. And um, if you're going to uh, create a campaign in this setting, your players need to understand this is just, this is, there's, there are not going to be very many happy moments, if any, uh, in this campaign. It's, it's just, um, it's dark. So, um, but it's dark in an evocative sort of way. So that's it. Um, thanks for attending a yet another one of my uh, videos. I think this makes number 29. And so who knows, maybe I'll make a number 30 sometime in the near-ish future. Uh, but until then, I've got to get back to my reading, which was, you know, some Shadow of the Demon Lord good stuff here. All right. So anyway, that's all I got. So fuck off now. I actually stole that from critical drinker a podcast uh, i listen to he actually says something different but i'll like fuck off now because it uh, sounds funny anyway hail